Hello, I'm Allison Thorpe, and this is God Talk, recorded and produced in the bluegrass state of Kentucky, the home of horses, hills, hiking, hillbillies, big trucks, wildcat basketball, and Daniel Boone, the state where guns are honored and shoes are optional. This is the show where science, faith, and culture are discussed openly. Welcome to God Talk, a show where a rocket scientist and a medical doctor, who is also my pastor, talk about science and religion. I'm your host, Doug Thorpe. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Dr. Andy White. Today on God Talk, we have Dr. Edgar Andrews of London, England, who is going to talk to us about the evidential claims for God's existence. Dr. Andy, welcome to the show. Hi, Doug. Uh, Dr. Andrews, Edgar Andrews, is a professor emeritus from the uh, University of London, uh, his actual formal training that he has his Ph.D. and D.S.C. and in, in multiple doctorates in are actually in materials, material science. And uh, he's really worked as an expert and an, a scholar and an academician in the science of large molecules. So what that says to me, he's a really smart guy who <laughs> has worked with both physics and chemistry. And so he's a scientist. and He's now retired. But Dr. Andrews wrote, uh, he's also a a self-made theologian, and he wrote a book that was highly influential in my life, and that's why we're interviewing him today, and his book was called Who Made God? Who Made God? That's the name of the book, Searching for a Theory of Everything. Now, we've heard, we've had people talking about big toes, theory of everything, but this guy is tying it to the question... Who made God? And that's the name of his book, which well, came out Well, if he has a book ago. named Who Made God, I'm hoping he uh, has the answer. You know, I, he, I am as well. <laughs> I am as well. And I know what this if anybody hasn't read this book or you have a lot of questions in the area that God talk, talks to and speaks to, the conversation on here, you should read Dr. Andrews' book. Now, I contacted doc, Dr. Andrews, who, like I say, he's an older gentleman. He's been retired for several years. I don't know that he does a lot of interviews anymore, but I specifically contacted him because this book was so influential in my life. And let me tell you how, Doug. Okay. Um, I, you know, back when I had was a young Christian and moving from the life of being in, an atheist and an agnostic, um, I had a lot of questions. And back then, I didn't have anywhere to get those answers. I I didn't find I didn't have a God talk to go to and listen to at that time, and in fact, in that day there weren't even uh, I don't even think iTunes existed. So this is a ways back. So I went to the bookstores and the bookshelves, and I found books on what I would say now are Christian apologetics. But the one that I needed, I needed answers on who made God, where did he come from, did he make the world, why do I see design in the universe, and scientists say it's not. Uh, how do I bring together my scientific understanding with faith that I'm developing? So I had a lot of questions, and his book answered many of those questions. So this is really an honor for me. You know, we we interviewed uh, Kenneth Samples last right, week, right. and that was a big deal for me because he also was influential at a later time in my life. But Dr. Andrews was influential at a time when I really didn't have a way to get those answers. So his book was real meaningful to me, so this is a super honor to get him to come on. Well, fantastic. All right. Sounds like a great show. First, this is God Talk. It's brain candy for the thinking Christian, a bad day for the atheist, or a provocative question for the seeker. And this is God Talk, where we rightly divide the line between science and faith. Let's go ahead and get Dr. Andrews on the line. All right. Dr. Andrews... uh, Tell our audience about your educational background, your work as both a scientist and a theologian, and list some of your important writings in both realms. Yes, thank you. Um, My educational background is a first degree in theoretical physics, followed by PhD uh, degree in experimental physics and a DSC, that's a higher doctorate, again in physics. Um, <clears throat> educational wise, um, I guess uh, my education continued when I entered uh, industry uh, for my first job. 
and I was introduced there to the field of polymer science, that's the science of large molecules, and I've really been in that field and in the field of material science ever since. Um, I have also, as you point out, um, <clears throat> written a number of theological works, and uh, I have no formal education in theology. I'm self-taught, if you like. Mm -hmm. and I've done an enormous amount of reading in theology and to a lesser extent in philosophy. Sure. And over a, a period of years and decades, I have found people valued my uh, theological insights and were very happy to publish, for example, two uh, commentaries, two Bible commentaries, one on Galatians and the other on Hebrews. Um, I, I have specialized, apart from my technical writings, my research papers, which are uh, more than a hundred in number, and have been published in uh, leading peer-reviewed journals, uh, throughout the world. Um, apart from that, my my writings have been aimed to convey uh, basic ideas to the layman, or the lay person, I should say. Sure, sure. Uh, in other words, both in science and in theology, I have tended to write for the non-expert seeking to interpret um, what are perhaps uh, complex ideas into the language and thought forms of uh, the normal person. And I think that that is one of the things that I have contributed uh, most effectively. Yes, and we very much appreciate that. Right, right. Well, tell us briefly how you became a man of faith in a world where scientists are atheists and agnostics. I became a Christian at the age of 19. <clears throat> I was um, coming to the end of my first year at university studying physics. And all I can say is that having had no interest in religion at all uh, and having no upbringing in Christianity, uh, my parents were not uh, practicing Christians, we never discussed God or any such matters at home. Uh, I was given uh, a sudden desire, hunger, I can almost say, to read the New Testament, uh, which I had never been interested in before. Uh, I didn't possess a copy, so I borrowed a copy from a friend, and I began to read. And as I read, the person of Jesus Christ became real to me. So real, in fact, that I sometimes felt his presence in the room as I was reading the New Testament. And I then began talking to him, hmm. uh, which of course is prayer, the first real prayer I had ever prayed. And uh, as I continued reading, the, the evident truth of what I was reading was born in upon me. Uh, there never was any issue in my mind between this newfound faith and the science I was studying at university. Hmm. Uh, in fact, they seemed to fit together as a hand in a glove, because... <laughs> the study of science I saw as a study of the world that God had created and which he even now sustains. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've seen science as a, as a window, if you like, into the larger realities that are embraced by my faith and by the teaching of Scripture. 
That's great. Uh, that is so important for this show because we really delve into the in, the relationship between faith and science, and so uh, it's it's awesome for us to see a scientist of your nature and your uh, your pedigree to be someone who found those connections naturally. So we're going to move on to some of the key foundational questions about origins, which are often so important to to atheists and agnostics and Christians alike. Uh, can right. you just yeah? Can you describe your understanding of the origin of the universe and how the theistic view of that of the origin of the universe differs from the atheistic view, and how that the origin of the cosmos makes a case for God's existence as the creator? All right. Um, <clears throat> the, let me give a little bit of history here. Sure. Uh, until. Uh, exactly a hundred years ago, the vast majority of scientists believed that the universe was was static and everlasting. Uh, in other words, the universe was the stage on which our lives and experiences were played out. But all that began to change in 1915 when Albert Einstein came up with his general theory of relativity. Uh, in fact, he tells how his equations uh, gave him some trouble because he discovered after he had uh, he had defined uh, and worked out these equations that they did not make it possible for the universe to be static. Hmm. Uh, and uh, he was very troubled by this because that was, the, that was the received wisdom of the day. So he introduced a fudge factor. Uh, he <laughs> called it the cosmological constant. And he added that to one of his equations, which had the effect of enabling that equation to describe a static universe. Uh, he later said that that uh, addition of the cosmological constant was his greatest blunder. <laughs> oh, no. Because it day. wasn't very long until um, two other scientists, uh, Alexander Friedman in 1922 and Georges Lemaitre in 1927, uh, found what we might call evolutionary rather than static solutions to Einstein's equations. And those solutions, of course, implied an origin to the universe, mm -hmm. but it could not have been eternal and always present and unchanging. And, of course, subsequent developments have brought about what um, uh, is known as the standard model of the universe and uh, more popularly known as the Big Bang cosmology, which um, essentially uh, states that, yes, there was an origin to the universe. Uh, it did start, it did begin. And uh, that, of course, was only confirming what had been written three and a half thousand years before in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a beginning. Now, <clears throat> that um, idea of a beginning, although at first many people, many scientists were very upset at the theological implications and tried to deny uh, the reality of Big Bang cosmology. Uh, nevertheless, the vast majority of cosmologists today do believe in it and accept it. Mm -hmm. But their acceptance is takes a rather strange form. Uh, you say, how does the theistic view of the origins sure. uh, of the universe differ from the atheistic view. But, right. Uh, the, the, <clears throat> the most recent um, output of, of atheistic cosmology
psychologist uh, is, I think, embodied in, in two books, um, uh, Stephen Hawking and a co-author published a book called The Grand Design in 2010, and Lawrence Krauss uh, published a book called A Universe from Nothing in 2013. So that's really up to date. Yes. The interesting thing is, of course, that they both accept that the universe had a beginning. They're no longer trying to suggest that there was no beginning. Well, but they try to explain it away um, and... Uh, I can go into the detail there, but basically they are saying that the universe uh, created itself. Well, that leads me to my question, which is, you know, how does the origin of life make a case for the divine creator rather than, you know, these uh, random explanation of a life originating from random processes? Okay, well, uh, before we come to life, let me just say a little bit more about the idea that the universe created itself. Yes, I, I would like you, if you can, elaborate on it, because Lawrence Krauss basically says, for, for our audience, I want to say this, that uh, there was a quantum vacuum or that the, the universe came from nothing, but I want to say that uh, I'm curious of what you think about his definition of nothing, because his definition of nothing is not nothing to me. So that's that's my question and my retort about that. Well, that's what I was going to say. Um, Good. The, 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 the important point to grasp is that even if you accept this idea of the universe creating itself, uh, you have to appeal to the laws of nature. Um because you can't have a scientific explanation of anything without appealing to the laws of nature. Sure. And so uh, they have to assume that whatever else existed or didn't exist before the universe began, the laws of nature had to exist. And one has to ask, of course, then, where did they exist? Uh, if yes. there was no space or time, uh, no energy, no matter, uh, before the universe existed, how could the laws of nature exist? And there's only one answer, really, to that. They existed in the mind of God. Yes. Yes. And actually, I, I've, I've got an hour-long uh, uh, podcast <laughs> on this subject, Um can be found on edgarandrews.podomatic.com called Atheism's Logical Cul-de-Sac. Okay. And um, it goes into this in great detail. But, uh, you know, just to elaborate briefly on that before we get on to life, uh, nothing existed, meaning absolutely nothing, not the laws of nature, the quantum vacuum, the multiverse, but the the Bible claims it came ex nihilo, from nothing, and, and you agree that as a physicist, the laws of physics were in the mind of God, but did not did not exist uh, prior to the Big Bang until God created them from his mind. Would you agree with that? Yes, yes, okay. indeed. Okay. And now Doug asked about the origin of life. We're talking about the origin of the universe coming yeah. from God. Right, now is the origin of life, yes. Yeah, so now if you could talk about the theistic idea of life, uh, origin, as opposed to just random processes. Yes, I mean, <clears throat> the origin of life is an enormous subject, of course, in its own right. Sure. But um, there is uh, uh, there are several levels at which... Uh, it is impossible to offer a scientific explanation of the origin of life occurring by chance, which is, after all, what the what the atheist has to claim. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just mentioned two of those levels. The first level is that 
random chemistry that could never have produced life as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, because, for example, and I give many more examples in, in my book, uh, Who Made God? Searching for a Theory of Everything. Now you're talking uh, about chemical evolution here. Basically, chemicals just coming together to make the first living organ cell. That's right. Okay. Um, but um, what I was going to say was that it's not possible for random chemistry to produce the kind of molecules that are necessary uh, for life uh, to reproduce itself. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, in uh, a protein is composed of uh, a, a whole string of amino acids. But every single one of those amino acids has to be a left-handed amino acid. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the acids, most of them, not all of them, but most of them exist in more than one form. And uh, in layman's terms, uh, you can have a left-handed form and a right-handed form, just as you can have a left-handed glove and a right-handed glove. Right. And uh, in the molecules that constitute life, um, both the both the proteins and the nucleic acids are all composed of uh, left or right-handed. Um, uh, units, subunits. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't have a mixture of left and right-handed uh, units in the same molecule. Right. That doesn't work for life. So that is never going to happen uh, just automatically because random chemistry, accidental combination of atoms and molecules, will all you always give you a mixture of left and right-handed molecules. Now that's just one example mm -hmm. of how right, right. and chemistry cannot produce um, uh, the molecules necessary for life. Now the second level, uh, which shows it impossible for random chemistry to produce life, is of course that the, the whole essence of life consists of Information, mm -hmm. uh, information which is written on the molecules, on the DNA molecules in the first instance, uh, using a very sophisticated code mm. which resembles in every respect an advanced language. Right. And uh, we, we call it the genetic code, but there's much more to it than that. Um, but the point is, the information stored upon the DNA molecule um, is the blueprint for life. And that information is stored mm -hmm. using a highly sophisticated language. Yes. And languages do not arise by accident. They don't just happen. That's they have right. to be created by uh, some intelligent cause and input. So on those two levels, both the, the, the level of, of basic chemistry and the level of the information that constitutes life, really, that is written upon the DNA um, uh, in, in terms and by using a, a very sophisticated language, these things could not possibly happen by chance. And therefore, we have to look for an intelligent originator for life. Yeah. Um, piggybacking on that, Dr. Andrews, when I was in medical school, I was told you don't need to worry about a god because evolution explains everything. However, they didn't even talk about the origin of life, what you just addressed, which can't be explained by Darwinian processes. And they did not explain, on the other end, consciousness and the development of rationality and what we might eventually get to the soul. Um, 
can you tell me your thoughts on Darwinian macroevolution? And if you're a theistic evolutionist or you would be called an intelligent de- design believer, uh, where would you come down on that? The theory of macroevolution, and I must uh, draw a very clear distinction between uh, macroevolution and micro. Evolution. Microevolution is the kind of variation you get within a species and uh, which can lead to speciation, that is, reduction of two very, very closely related species from, from uh, one uh, original species. Microevolution. Uh, is is no problem. Right. Uh, uh, creationists like myself accept microevolution. To give a very simple example, um, all dogs, wolves, um, hyenas, all dog-like animals um, are almost certainly descended from one original dog kind. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the Bible the the book of Genesis talks about God creating animals and plants after their kind. A kind is not a species. Mm-hmm. A kind is uh, something that can give rise to a whole range of species of a very similar uh, characteristic with a uh, similar nature. What, what you can't do, uh, and... This has, of course, been attempted by artificial uh, breeding in plants and animals. What you can't do is to breed plants, let's say, let's say dogs or cats or racehorses. You can't breed them into a different kind of animal. Mm-hmm. You can't breed cats, there are a fantastic number of different breeds of cats, aren't there? But you can't breed cats into dogs. And you can't breed dogs into racehorses, or horses of any kind, for that matter. And there is, in fact, no scientific evidence for macroevolution. For macro. Uh, It is just... um, uh, There there is absolutely nothing that is truly scientific uh, to demonstrate the reality of macroevolution. The arguments that are given to support evolution are always microevolution arguments. Mm-hmm. And then people say, well, of course, what happens on a micro scale given a long period of time could happen on a macro scale? There's a continuity between macro and micro evolution. But in fact, there is not. Because in micro evolution, there is no creation of new biological information. Mm-hmm. Very often, in fact, there's a loss of biological information that gives rise to speciation. Whereas for macro evolution, you have got continually to be introducing novel uh, constructive information bearing structures into the genome and you can't do that no, that is just not possible mm-hmm. yes okay alright uh, what do you think about the origin of the human soul and what does it mean for human beings to be made in the image of God Well, I think the first thing you have to do is to be sure to define what you mean by soul, if we're going to use that word, Mm -hmm. because soul is used in a number of different ways in the Bible, for example, and certainly uh, there are many different ideas of what the word means. It can mean simply a person, a soul, Mm -hmm. but it can also mean a spiritual dimension in a person. And that, I think, is what uh, we're talking about. Um, so where did the spiritual 
dimension, the spiritual nature of man, which sets him apart from the animals, and I think most people would accept that. Mm -hmm. uh, animals have consciousness, mm -hmm. but only man himself is self-conscious in the sense of being self-aware. Uh, human consciousness has both an animal and a spiritual dimension. And the question is, where did the spiritual dimension come from? Um, well, the Bible, of course, has a very simple uh, answer to that, because it says that man was a special creation. He didn't uh, evolve from apes or any other precursor species. He was a special creation mm -hmm. of God, and he was created with a spiritual dimension in his nature, mm -hmm. and that is what is meant. I think, by uh, a man being created in the image of God. Okay. Uh, man is created in the spiritual and, uh, uh, and intellectual, almost, the wise um, nature of uh, the human mind uh, in, in the image of God. There are, there are aspects of the nature of God that are reflected in mankind. Man is a special creation having characteristics which reflect the divine nature. This is not true of animals. They can be conscious and uh, they can learn and they can do all kinds of things, but they lack this spiritual dimension. Now, the evolutionist will say that this is an emergent uh, characteristic of the human brain. They'll say the brain became so complicated and sophisticated, so, so advanced in its evolutionary um, ca character in man, uniquely in man, that something sort of jumped out of the work, something emerged from the workings of the brain. And that is man's spirit nature. Uh, but that is really pure speculation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know some some uh, uh, atheists who disagree profoundly with it. Mm -hmm. But um, the Bible answer, the Christian answer, is very clear. Man is made in the image of God because he was made in the image of God. He started out that way, was created that way. Yes. So then I, I guess uh, consciousness... Uh, you would would you think that to be synonymous with the soul, or in your idea of anthropology, would you say that um, consciousness is also in animals, but it's more this spiritual dimension beyond just uh, self reflective consciousness or ration? Would it be rationality, or could you maybe expand on that just a little bit? Yes, um, <clears throat> I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't equate the soul or, or spirit with consciousness. Uh, I would rather say that consciousness is a property of the soul or spirit. Uh, you see, the soul um, has other properties, such as an accountability to God and the ability to survive physical death and so on. Um, uh, consciousness, okay. therefore, is is one of the major characteristics of a spiritual being, but um, I, I wouldn't want to actually equate it with the soul or the spirit. I think it's, it's, it's an aspect of soul or spirit. Okay. Okay. Uh, how does the meaning of life and human destiny make a case for God's existence? Ah, uh, yes, I think that is an important question. <clears throat> um, uh, purpose, or teleology, they use a technical phrase, that is, uh, things happening with a goal or aim in, in view. Purpose, or teleology, is built into life. 
uh, even the word evolution means unfolding mm-hmm. of a potential of that which is potential and which then unfolds. So even the word evolution uh, implies uh, purpose or teleology, although, of course, the atheist wouldn't accept that. Um, but I think it does imply that. Um, and then science, uh, the the ultimate purpose of science is to search out the meaning and rationality behind the universe. Mm-hmm. Well, well, why do we do science? Well, science can be practically useful, of course, uh, and, and that's a good reason for doing it. But uh, ultimately, from a philosophical point of view, the purpose of science is to search out uh, meaningful things about the universe. And, and, you know, human beings instinctively believe in purpose or destiny. Mm-hmm. Uh, the child asks why, uh, expecting everything to have a reason. You know, we're hardwired as human beings to look for a reason not just a cause, mm-hmm. but a reason. And there's a, dis- a difference, of course, between those two things. Yes. Uh, yet uh, atheism, of course, it can't live with the concept of purpose or teleology. Um, uh, it, it just cannot accept that and, 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 and has to ignore such things as the elegance and mathematical nature of the laws of nature which themselves point to purpose, Mm -hmm. not just chance. A consistent atheist, therefore, must accept that life is meaningless, Mm. but I don't think any human being can live uh, with that belief controlling their lives. Most atheists don't live that way. They strive to create meaning in their own lives uh, and... In that way, uh, they acknowledge that meaningfulness is essential for human well-being and happiness. Uh, as I say, we are hard, hardwired. Our minds and our natures are hardwired to look for meaning in life and in the events of life and in the world and universe around us. And I do not think uh, uh, anyone can really live a consistent atheist life in which the whole idea of meaning has been thrown overboard and dismissed. I don't know of anybody who can do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, what about explain the importance of design within the universe and how this is strongly points to God over atheism. Well, that that follows from the uh, from the last point, doesn't it? Sure. About meaning, sure. um, <clears throat> because anything meaningful is, by definition, designed for a purpose. Uh, I mean, that could be a definition of meaningfulness um, designed for a purpose. Now, what I find interesting is that atheism admits that the world around us exhibits the appearance of design. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that confirms exactly what the Bible tells us. Um, Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4, for example. Let me just read those. Uh, Take a moment to do that. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out throughout all the earth, and the works uh, to the end of the earth. Uh, the, 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 The Evident design in the universe ought to show us that it was designed 
for a purpose. Um, of course, the apostle Paul takes this up in uh, in in Romans, doesn't he? Where he says that the invisible things of God are clearly seen from the creation of the world, mm-hmm. uh, even his eternal power and Godhead uh, or deity manifested in the design of creation around us. Now, the atheist cannot deny the appearance of design, and does not. <laughs> yeah. They yeah. admit. It's too obvious, it's yeah. Design. Um, yeah, but why can they not accept that it is design? Well, because they are atheists. They, <laughs> they do not want to believe in God. They do not like to retain God in their knowledge, and uh, yeah. and therefore they go to great lengths to develop theories and ideas that argue how the appearance of design could have happened by accident. <laughs> yeah. But I don't think that's a very logical position. <laughs> that's right. right. And we talk a lot about that on this show, and they'll say it appears designed. In fact, uh, Dawkins even says that in his book, that life appears designed, but it's not. And they say they do a lot of mental gymnastics trying to get around that. Well, moving on from design, Dr. Andrews, this is uh, really getting at the, the key of your book because atheists often make the retort to these evidential arguments that we've been making for God with the polemic question, who made God? And their question is, if you say God created everything, their their question is, okay, then who made God? And this is your book's title. So how do you respond to this rejoinder? Yeah, that, that, this is a, um, an interesting point, I think. <clears throat> the simple and obvious answer is that God is, by definition, the self-existent prime mover. Mm. So, in other words, nobody made God. He's mm. self-existent and has always existed. Um, <clears throat> the Bible says, of course, that this prime mover uh, is the God who has created and who now sustains the universe and who speaks to us, tries to communicate with us through the Bible. But uh, even going back to the bare bones of the matter, God is the starting point of all things, material and non-material. Now, uh, the atheist comes along and says, well, there is no self-existent starting point. Mm. Uh, this is this God is, is something you have manufactured yourself. God didn't make us, we made God. Mm. Um, but then uh, the atheist is left with a, a, a very serious dilemma. He is trapped in an infinite regression. Mm. <laughs> Now, I don't know whether I've got time to tell the story of the turtles, but I'll do it, and you can cut it out. (laughs) (laughs) No, please do. (laughs) Um, The the story goes, and and Stephen Hawking tells the story on page one of his book, uh, A Brief Brief History of Time. Um, The story goes that um, uh, an old lady went and listened to a lecture on the solar system. And after the lecture, she told the lecturer uh, that he got it all wrong because the Earth is supported on the back of a giant turtle. And the lecturer said, well, uh, what is that turtle standing on? And she said, oh, on on another turtle. (laughs) And he said, well, what is that turtle standing on? (laughs) He said, oh, you can't catch me out that way. It's turtles all the way down. (laughs) That is an infinite regression. Yeah, right. And an infinite regression obviously in, uh, has no explanatory power because every time you offer an explanation, you then have to offer an explanation for the explanation. <laughs> now, the atheist, if he denies that there is a self existent starting point or prime mover, is trapped in that infinite regression <laughs> because he's got to keep saying, well, the universe was caused by this and and this, whatever it is, was caused by something else, and that was caused by something else. 
And, mm-hmm. and uh, he therefore finishes up with a uh, an idea, a concept that is utterly useless and has zero explanatory power. Nonsense. Uh, he may prefer a different uncreated starting point, mm-hmm. like the discredited idea that the physical universe itself is eternal right. and is the starting point, the brute fact universe. But he cannot escape the need for a starting point. That's, that's the thing I'm trying to get home. Absolutely. And that starting point, I believe, because the universe is a contingent um, entity, it could have been different from what it is, um, that starting point, I believe, has to be outside of the universe. It mm-hmm. has to be non-material. It has to be the God of the Bible, in my view. Yes. Okay, Dr. Andrews, All right, I'm going to take you back to our very first episode, and that is, how can there be a good God when there is so much evil and suffering in the world? We did, our very first show was on this question. Well, the, the, the answer can be stated in two words, although we certainly need a bit more explanation than that. <laughs> the two words are the fall. Mm-hmm. Now, the Bible teaches, in fact, that God created a perfectly good world in which there was no evil. But in that world, he gave his peak creation, mankind itself, the freedom to obey him freely, free will, we call it. Mm -hmm. He gave uh, to Adam and Eve the ability to transgress against his commandments. And that is what they did. They fell uh, from obedience to God. And as a result, God put the universe and mankind as an occupant of that universe and everything else into a state of Uh, what the New Testament calls futility. Uh, In other words, the universe uh, and the the biosphere, if you like, in particular, and mankind in even greater particular, uh, has been plunged into a condition of judgment under God for the disobedience of Adam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we live in that order, that, that world order, a world order uh, where the world is under the judgment of God. And God has given the world over and mankind over uh, to fulfill his own evil and rebellious nature, hmm. uh, which uh, arises from his, his primal disobedience to God. Uh, in other words, Uh, God has not created the evil that we see in the world. God has placed the world under judgment, and the evil is something that emerges from that that futile condition, um, uh, or that bondage to corruption, as Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8. The bondage to corruption, that is the judgment of God. Now, the Bible teaches that God is going to reverse that judgment, that because of the work of Christ, of Jesus Christ upon the cross, uh, because he died uh, to deal with the sin problem, because he rose again to justify those who put their trust in him, uh, there is coming a day when God is going to take away the judgment and he's going to reverse that judgment, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth in which dwell righteousness. Um, and that is something the Christian can look forward to. Uh, the atheist, of course, cannot, because he doesn't believe a word of it. Sure. But the evil uh, and the pain and the suffering that is in the world is a consequence of man's rebellion against his creator. Uh, and, and that is, I think, the, the only answer uh, that can be given. 
Yes, and uh, I think that skeptics often claim that, you know, a good and loving God should have created a better world, you know, and they'll they'll say it shouldn't have so much pain or so much evil or suffering shouldn't be here. They'll have this cynical response. It's a very common uh, retort of agnostics and atheists. So just like we ask for an explanation for evil, the next question that the philosophers would throw up is, could he have created it better or does, is the world good? And, uh, a lot of people answer that differently. I'd like to know what you think. Is this a good world, and is it is it good enough from a good creator? The, the, the only way God have cre- God could have created a world inhabited by mankind uh, that would never go wrong, if I can put it that way, mm-hmm. would have been to make man incapable of decision mm-hmm. of, of, of rebellion. If he had made man incapable of rebellion, then man would not have rebelled, obviously. But that, obviously, is, was not God's purpose, because, uh, after all, if man is made in the image of God, he has got to have some of the, if I, I might put it this way, some of the freedom that God has uh, to make his own decision. Now, uh, you know, uh, the, the the stones and the bricks in my house don't make decisions. Their, their nature right. is fixed. They cannot change their mind. They don't have a mind to change. But if God is going to make man one of his created beings, if he's going to make him in his own image, then that image has implications. Mm -hmm. And the implications are free will, freedom of choice. Now, so you might say, well, why didn't God create a world in which man had no freedom of choice? Uh, Well, God didn't want to create that sort of world. (laughs) That's the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, we uh, really appreciate you being here and uh, can't thank you enough, Dr. Andrews. All right, Doug, that was Dr. Edgar Andrews from London, um, and he gave us a really good interview on important evidential arguments for God. Absolutely. I was uh, quite impressed. This is a a scientist with a large pedigree and uh, who's done quite a bit on the theology side. As well, and... I like the fact that I'm sure you did that all of his official and formal training, his doctorates that he has multiple, are actually in physics and in uh, large molecule science. Right, right. Uh, but uh, well, basically chemistry and physics. But uh, he's really educated himself as a theologian. But wow, quite a <laughs> quite, quite a, a theologian. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I really enjoyed it. Absolutely. And uh, we'll continue on interviewing experts to make the case for God. But first, this is God Talk, where we faithfully examine science and we reasonably examine faith. And this is God Talk, where we rightly divide the line between science and faith. Stay tuned to hear all the ways you can connect with God Talk. Thank you for listening. Please visit our website at godtalk.com. Our audio files can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, and many other podcast platforms. You can find all of our God Talk videos by searching Dr. Andy and Doug on YouTube. Please visit our Facebook page at www.facebook.com slash Dr. Andy and Doug. Thank you for listening.